unless you have a very special set group of people, then you're going to get diversity. And if you're going to get diversity, you're going to get diversity in learning styles and preferences. All of those things that we know people are very early. The optimum educational design is one that incorporates as many options as is practical to enable that wide range of options. So my model of design would be initially to say, I'd say, who are the students and what are we trying to achieve? So who are the students in terms of dispositions, availability of resources, experience and all of that sort of stuff? What are the, what are the outcomes that have to be achieved? Are they discretionary? Are they open-ended? Or are they closed and sort of competency-based? What's, what's the nature of those outcomes? My next step would be to say, all right, well, taking all of that into account, then just blue sky. Let's not worry about what restrictions we've got on us just for a few minutes. What would be the ideal macro design? So work out what the ideal macro design is. At that point, I think you then have to say to yourself, well, all right, now we've got the ideal mac macro design. Now let's talk about the, uh, the resources that we've got available to us or the resources we can access. So they would be human, physical, financial, virtual. Taking the ideal macro design that we've now come up with, looking at the resources we've got available to us, what would be the best pragmatic approach that we could put in place? You know, if you're in a position where people are in industry learning, for example, and they are doing their studies at work, and you know that the workplace has a standard set of infrastructures that are available, then you can assume that that's OK. But if you're talking about people working web-based at home, you, you've got no idea what they've got. And it's all right to say you can go to the library or whatever, but if you're talking part-time students that are working, they have other, got other demands on your life. And, of course, and within that best pragmatic approach, then I think one of the things you have to think about clearly is diversity, but also what you can manage, what you can survive mm. with in the long term. And, but it needs to be sustainable from an organisational point of view, mm. from an academic point of view, and from a learner point of view. And without that sustainability, you just do it as a one. In the first place, in that design phase, I think rather than talking about which technologies are available in post learning, I think what you should be talking about, what are the functionalities that one is looking to achieve? So are we looking at distribution of content, secure, unsecure? Are we looking at communication, synchronous, asynchronous, face-to-face, -face distance? Are we looking at um, what is its functionality in terms of assessment? and what are the functionalities in terms of support. And I think that's where you actually start to make inroads into, into these technologies. And you say, well, what, I'm re what we really need is we really need to get these students talking to each other. So what's the best way of doing that? It, what's the purpose of getting them to talk, about, talk with each other? Well, really, it's about, about them supporting each other and what they're doing. Are we looking at them creating new knowledge you know, as a group? No, we're not looking at it. We just want them to talk to each other so they know they're not alone. Well, there's a, you know, there are ways that you can do that. Whereas if you're looking at saying, well, the purpose of the exercise is to get them to journal their activities and to reflect on that as individuals or small groups, then a blog is a perfectly good way of doing that. What's the simplest technology most appropriate?